Well, good morning and good afternoon for some. My name is Jennifer Joyce, and I am the Regional Vice President of Sales for Conducive Technologies here in the Western Territory. And today we're going to be talking with you about how you can boost SQL performance by at least 30%, if not double. Now, this webinar is really broken out into two parts. And the first part, I like to kind of consider the thought leadership portion of the, the call. During that that first part of the call, we're just going to really kind of dig in under the hood, under the technology stack to explain what are some of the I.O. inefficiencies that are occurring, some of the I.O. degradation issues that are occurring in the environment, um, especially if you're running SQL Server, especially particularly if you virtualize that workload, uh, and kind of what's happening under the hood that's stealing some of that throughput uh, that you, you would normally expect to be able to get out of your environment that you aren't quite getting. Um, the second part of the conversation is really going to focus on what those inherent I.O. penalties are that are occurring, and uh, we're going to bring a couple of those to light and, and really focus on those. Now, uh, just real quick, um, a, a highlighter preview here. Velocity is what we're going to be talking today, and that is a 100% software solution. It's just a software uh, that, that runs silently in the background on Windows. Uh, it's tackling those I.O. inefficiencies that we're going to be talking about solving and getting you that 30% plus faster SQL experience. Now, obviously the compelling event is, you know, what other ways do you have to solve those types of performance issues other than just having to buy more hardware? Uh, I know hardware's gotten a lot cheaper these days, but it's not cheap when you have to buy a lot of it. And uh, there's all the overhead of having to do upgrades and things like that. So this is a really unique solution that can actually solve that, as I said, with a 100% software approach, a very non-disruptive uh, method to address this issue. Now, uh, just a couple quick housekeeping things. At the end of the webinar, we will giving, be giving you a complimentary, not for resale copy. Uh, it's more than a $500 MSRP value to you, just because we know that ultimately the proof is in the pudding. We want you to get your hands on it. We want you to be able to experience the software. Now, on the line with me is my partner in crime, uh, Howard Butler. And uh, Howard is the Senior Director of Systems Engineering. And for any of you car fans out there, if you're ever on a one-on-one -on -one call with him, not only does he specialize in helping to accelerate performance on computers, but he is also a race car instructor. So if you ever, ever get a chance to get a, on a call with him, uh, you can pick his brain about that. Howard. Well, thanks very much, Jennifer. Always glad to join you here. You know, and you know, guys, you know, by the way, don't let Jennifer's title fool you. Uh, even though she's in sales, she's quite technical, as you're going to find out as we go along. But, you know, Jennifer, there is one thing I did want to mention, and that is we do like to make these sessions rather interactive. So, guys, there's a Q&A box in the webinar panel there. And as we go through the session, if you do have questions, please feel free to write them up, submit them, and then Jennifer and I will either get to those questions during the session or perhaps towards the end there. And I uh, just kind of wanted to make a plug for that, Jennifer. So thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for joining, Howard. And thanks for mentioning the Q&A box. In fact, I just opened the Q&A box, so I've got a view of it. Um, if some, a couple of you want to just throw a shout out, just a hello out there, we'll uh, start getting some comments into the box. And we definitely, as Howard said, uh, want to keep that interactive. Um, so looking forward to this today. Now. Um, hello, great. Hey, Brian, thanks for uh, thanks for dropping that in. So, let's go ahead and and get started here with a little bit of the content. So, with conducive technologies, you may not have heard of us, and you may be going kind of scratching your head, going, "Who are these guys? Why do they think they have any?" thought leadership to be speaking about the topic that they're talking about today. So I'm not going to belabor this. I personally don't like it when someone spends too much time on their corporate slide, but I also want to know who I'm talking to. So I'm just going to get right to the point here, talk a little bit about what our street cred is. And uh, so we are a 38-year-old software company. We are the 12th oldest software company in the world. Uh, we originally started out as a company known as DiskKeeper. Some of you may have heard of that. In fact, some of you may even be using that software um, in the past for your hard disk drives. But about five years ago, the company, we brought some really revolutionary technology forward into the marketplace that had absolutely nothing to do with our traditional defragmentation approaches. 
And it's, it's really all about how we can reduce the noisy I.O., how we can get rid of unnecessary I.O. It, it, it turns out that a lot of the I.O. that's happening in environments is just doesn't even need to be there. How can we address that? Um, and on any given SQL Server system, there's going to be anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of the I.O. traffic that is just pure noise, and it's just stealing throughput. So we found that uh, we're able to offload 30 to 40 percent, if not more, of all of the I.O. from having to go down to storage, and that's what's going to give us that 30 percent plus faster performance on our SQL workloads. Now, for the work in developing this new technology, Gartner named us Cool Vendor of the Year when we launched that into the marketplace. They literally didn't have a quadrant to put us into because there is nobody who does what we do. We are completely unique in the industry. Um, now, we've had this product, like I said, out for over five years now. It's had great growth in the marketplace. We're well over 2,500 uh, mid-range, uh, you know, mid-sized to large enterprise range customers. Um, and we also have, I might mention, various iterations of our software OEM'd by some of the, uh, the contributors you see here. And uh, this is on a, another piece of the technology that we'll be talking about uh, as we get into the presentation. So, Howard, one other thing I want to mention is our partnership, uh, one VMware, to, VMware, we are a tap partner, we're up on their solution site. Uh, but also, Howard, I think you have a little bit more knowledge on the Microsoft side. Um, we were just recently awarded a certification for SQL IO reliability. You know, you're right, Jennifer. You know, and I consider this a pretty elite certification. You know, Microsoft does have some very, you know, specific criteria uh, to make sure that other applications like ourselves, you know, are fully compatible with their software, in this particular case, you know, SQL Server. But as you said, you know, we're the only software vendor in there. And I think we're in pretty good company with, with the likes of, you know, EMC, HP, and, and, and others. You know, and besides all the testing, that we had to go through, um, there was also a panelist of SQL experts that, you know, we had to satisfy all of their curiosities and questions and so forth uh, to really uh, achieve this level of, of Microsoft certification. So again, I think it's a pretty significant accomplishment out there, Jennifer. Thank you, Howard. So we're going to jump right into uh, the thought leadership portion of the call right now. And what I want to share with you guys is some results from a survey that we've done. We've done this survey four years in a row now. And in each year we, we survey over 1,000 IT professionals. We get responses um, you know, from around 1,000 people each year. And we really want to focus on what is causing the most performance issue in an environment today. Well, SQL keeps rising to the top uh, as being that, that application that has that degradation. And typically we see around 28, 27 percent of all respondents raising their hand and saying, yep, that's us. We have slow SQL performance bad enough that we are getting user complaints. Um, and we're just seeing that consistently year over year. It's not getting any better. And really, you know, as I mentioned, SQL keeps rising to the top. The next question we ask is, you know, of all your I.O. intensive apps that you support, which one is the most challenging? And that's where we get the SQL. Kind of the word cloud shows our, our results. Um, but clearly database and, and BI and large, large data is having, a, uh, having the, the most difficult to support. Now, seven out of ten of our new customers start with us on SQL. And that's what this webinar is focused on. But I do want to just mention, and you've probably already caught me alluding to this, is that our software is Windows focused. And this is actually the same and true for any application running in Windows, that there is excess I.O. And that excess I.O. is not created by SQL. It's not created by the application. It's actually created by Windows, dragging down the SQL performance. And that's what we're here to fix. So now let me just jump into the, uh, the next slide here. So we're going to get right into this. Now, I appreciate everyone who said hello in the Q&A box uh, during that, that test. Um, welcome to everyone. We're going to start getting into a little bit more of the technical part of this. And we really do welcome everyone to be dropping your questions in as we go. We will try to keep this interactive to answer as we go. But if we don't get to your question during the presentation, we will have a Q&A session as well at the end. 
Now, um, let's talk a little bit more about this. Now, as you can see on the screen here, this is a, obviously a very high-level rudimentary extraction of, of your IO profile. But I think the takeaway is pretty obvious and immediate. What we're looking at here is that you can get nice, large, clean, contiguous writes and reads. This is an ideal IO profile. This is what you would get with a, a healthy uh, payload of data for every IO operation. Um, you get an, a nice sequential look to the traffic. This is optimal. This is easy to process. This is what it should look like. But what actually is happening, if we just take a look at the next slide here, is that, you know, again, another immediate takeaway, suddenly now in this environment, there's this more chaotic I.O. characteristic. And these I.O.s are much smaller. They're more fractured. They get randomized. It's what we call death by a thousand cuts. And with that scenario, your underlying architecture is processing workloads, but ultimately it's, it's having to work much harder than it really needs to to process those workloads. It's kind of akin to pouring molasses all over your flash storage. And it really kind of doesn't matter if you've got spinning disk, tiered, flash storage, hybrid, or even if you're, those workloads are now going out to the cloud, this issue still happens. Uh, I just saw a very funny um, posting the other day that one of my customers had thrown up, and it was uh, um, the, the guy from, um, I'm forgetting the name of the movie, uh, but anyway, he had said, well, it, the, the posting was, what if I told you that the cloud was just somebody else's server, case in point. Right, so it's really interesting too because one of the things that we're looking at is with this IO characteristic um, <clears throat> and the blender effect, we're going to talk about these two, two taxes that are here. It used to be that the disk was the weak link, but I was just referring to hybrid, all flash, cloud, you're paying for, you know, uh, SSD, SLAs up in the cloud. The disk used to be the weak link slowing things down. That's no longer the case. The bottleneck has actually moved upstream. You now, most people have 100,000 IOPS or whatever it is they're sitting on. They're not really using just a small percentage of it. What we're talking about today is the work you're actually processing, not all the potential IOPS you have that you're not using. Let's focus on that 5-10% of the I.O. capacity and, and work you're actually doing. That is, is slowed by 30 to 40%. Um, <clears throat> so I've just got a comment in saying that uh, someone is having a difficulty hearing me on audio. Dawn, how's my, how's my audio? Oh, I hear you perfectly loud and clear. Okay. Um, Great, we got, we got some audio checks. So Dawn, if you might uh, check into my private box and uh, message back the person that just commented to me that they were having audio issues. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So, so what we're talking about here is that the bottlenecks have now moved upstream. So what's happening is Windows used to throw out more data than the disk could handle. It's the reverse way too now. Windows cannot throw out as much as the disk can handle. So you really have all this high-end hardware sitting there idling. What we do is we come in and we fix Windows so that it sends out more data faster. You get a lot faster throughput because now your hardware can be put to work. It's, it's sitting there twiddling its thumbs. We're going to get that throughput recovered by healing this next bottleneck up. And I'll just make a comment too that one of the reasons people don't optimize the Windows operating system is simply because they don't know it's possible. And that's what we're here sharing with you today is that we have the only industry tool that can accelerate the Windows operating system itself. So this is a very important knob to turn in your environment as you're tuning and looking for those performance boosts. Now let's talk a little bit more about what Windows is doing that's causing this issue. Now the first thing that I want to talk about is actually down on the bottom, the IO blender effect. Now it's likely that you've heard of that term, and it's a term that we actually helped Gartner coin a little more than five or six years ago when virtualization was really coming across the landscape. Now the IO blender effect is what happens the moment that you virtualize more than one server into a host, and you put, <coughs> excuse me, um, I've, Dawn, I've got another comment coming in on um, connectivity as well, so I'll, I'll uh, just let you know about that. Uh, but, but basically what we've got is that you know, you've got every time you add another VM to a host, you're going to start getting this IO blender effect where you have all of these different IO streams from all these different VMs now converging and competing for resources. Now, as bad as that is, if you move upstream a little bit and you look at the Windows IO tax, this is what happens when each individual VM is contributing that IO. Now, 
this is the Windows issue, okay? So Windows breaks up the files to be much smaller in the IOs than they need to be. And this is really difficult to process. Now, when we install our software, we heal that behavior and we can reduce a lot of the I.O. Now, one of the things that we've seen is that when somebody virtualizes, it tends to be slowly over time. They add more VMs, add more VMs, add more VMs. Now, everyone's pretty much already like 99% virtualized these days. But what we saw in some cases was when somebody did a full virtualization, flipped the switch overnight, they would really see the performance drag. But the people who went gradually over time really didn't see it because it kind of like when you're riding in the car and you're turning the radio up a little bit more, a little bit more, and you don't realize how loud it got. Same thing. You don't realize how the performance struck down over time. The next time you get in the car, you're blasted out. Same thing with this. Well, we had a customer who did go virtual overnight, and, and they kind of got that blasted out experience of performance going down. Um, and that was Chris's health. And they're one of the top 10 largest healthcare providers in the U.S. They're located out of Texas, and they virtualized their environment. It was 2,000 servers. They flipped the switch overnight, and they really saw things drag down. And Howard, I, I think that you actually were personally involved in that. Would you share a little bit of your insights with us on that one? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So, you know, with Christus, they did their testing like most people would do on individual systems, and, um, you know, they were kind of expecting that as they went from physical to virtual, they would get the same kind of performance. But when they virtualized all those systems, as you mentioned, Jennifer, that's not what happened. They saw a significant performance degradation. And during their analysis, what they found is that it wasn't CPU related, that it was not memory. It was indeed IO bottlenecks, Jennifer. And that's what was really causing their issues because now they have that sh overall shared infrastructure. And, you know, their first reaction was, geez, we're going to have to upgrade all of our storage, and we're going to have to go to all flash array to try to compensate or solve this type of problem. But you know what they did? Before they, they pursued that route, they got a hold of our software, and we worked with them, and they were able to resolve uh, with our software and see that those idle or those I.O. bottleneck issues were fully resolved. So, Jennifer, for them, it was a no-brainer. So rather than spending the $2 million plus dollars for all new storage flash arrays and stuff like that, we were able to save them that cost from having to uh, do that hardware upgrade. Thanks, Howard. You know, and one of the things that I've come across a lot as well is that when we do discovery calls with, with clients, um, and we ask, you know, about I.O. bottlenecks. And, and there's a real perception that there really aren't many I.O. bottlenecks or they don't have any. But when we deploy our software, the performance issues they were uh, experiencing actually go away. And that's when the, the bottlenecks actually become really apparent. And I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into this Windows I.O. tax real quick because there's really some severe inefficiencies in the handoff of data between Windows OS and the underlying storage. And, you know, part of the problem here is that there are no um, there are no APIs that connect the two other than using the rudimentary framework that Windows has always used by addressing the logical disk to write data. You know, and Howard, this creates a real serious problem because if the Windows operating system for any given file that should be written and read with one I.O. or two I.O.s or three I.O.s, just a minimal number of operations, Windows ultimately takes any given file and breaks it down to be much smaller than it needs to be. And ultimately, what happens is you end up in a situation where you're processing four I.O.s or multiple I.O.s for a single file that really should just be written or read with one I.O. Um, so, Howard, I think this, this is probably the, the crux of, of the conversation. I think we want to spend just a little bit more time on this. Would you just cover for us a little bit more of what's happening here, why Windows is so efficient in that handoff of data? be happy to. So the Windows file system truly does take more or less a one-size-fits type of approach. So when a file gets created or even extended, the file system really doesn't know how big to make that file, right? Because you're still composing the data, you're putting information in there and so forth. So it doesn't really know how big that file is going to be. And that creates a pretty significant problem. And what Windows will do, though, is on the logical side, within the file system, it's going to allocate the next available segment of free space. Well, that's great if, you know, you're creating a tiny file and the next available free space is more than sufficient. Great. But what happens over the course of time is the free space 
does wind up getting chopped up into small, tiny little pieces. And so what happens is if that next available free space is only 4 KB, but you're trying to write a much larger chunk of data, Windows is going to write what it can into that little section of free space and then issue that as an I.O. request and then go grab the next available free space, write what it can, and so forth. So what you wind up doing are all these tiny little allocations, and every one of those allocations is a separate I.O. So now what you're getting are all these small, random I.O.s rather than these larger, nice, sequential I.O.s. And later on, I'll, I'll touch bases on this and show, you know, explain a little bit more about how we solved this. But I think you can kind of see that the, the trade-offs here is that now you're getting all these small random IOs coming from the system itself. And if you ever look at benchmarks of storage devices, you know, Jennifer, they give you two numbers. You know, they're going to give you performance measurements based on random IO and on sequential IO. And you're always going to see that those larger sequential IOs outperform the random IO requests. So the bottom line is if we can help enforce Windows to behave better, and issue larger sequential IOs, you're naturally going to get the best performance out of your storage at that point. That's a really good point, Howard. You know, kind of case in point, uh, we have a, a case study published on our website uh, with the University of Illinois where their hardest hitting databases um, were applications running on both SQL and Oracle actually on Windows. And uh, they had put in the latest Dell compellent all flash arrays. Um, they uh, were fine on performance day one, but over time it had degraded and they thought they were going to have to add more shelves to meet their customer SLAs. They went in, they deployed our software, and boom, it was, uh, you know, that week it was recovered and they were able to continue with the hardware they already had in place, which was, like I, you know, like I said, was already the highest end flash, uh, flash arrays they could get. Um, so I'm starting to see a, a couple of questions come in, so go ahead and, and drop those in, but I am going to move on to the next slide here real quick as you guys start adding your questions in. Um, so one thing that we do want to focus on here is kind of how do, we, how do we approach this? How do we solve this? The first thing that we do to solve this is we actually address that inefficiency within Windows of how it's writing these files inefficiently on a very direct and proactive way. We'll cover that in just a moment. The second thing we do is uh, we, we leverage DRAM and we provide a dynamic read cache. We'll get into that just a little bit more as well. And then after we finish reviewing that, we'll just talk a little bit about um, you know, how you can get your hands on the software. We'll be doing the handoff of the software um, for your free NFR. And then if you also want to expand beyond just testing on one server, we can talk about how you can get access to our trialware, uh, that type of thing. So we'll move into a little bit about the technology of exactly how we're solving this. Now, Howard, let's, let's dive in here. So first, let's talk about what we're doing to optimize the writes. Now, we already talked about how Windows has this issue where it's only looking for the next available allocation, as you mentioned earlier, Howard. And then, again, we're talking about the logical disk layer. And it'll look for that first allocation whether it's the right size or not. So that's a challenge um, because we, we want to get large contiguous writes and reads, but as time goes on and files are written and erased, rewritten and extended, that's where this issue really begins to rear its head and the degradation and the breakdown starts occurring. So, you know, one example, just kind of to, to echo what you were saying, Howard, is that if you're trying to write a 64K file and the next available free space is only 4K, it's going to use it. It'll split, it'll find the next allocation, split, rinse and repeat until that whole file is fully written. Now, we have this patented technology that can actually solve that problem proactively and make sure that we're delivering every file with optimal density. So, Howard, maybe you can just share with us uh, real quick here how we're doing that, how we're coaching that Windows operating system to really go with this new write protocol um, that, that I'm describing here and get this optimization done. <laughs> Well, thanks, Jennifer. And, uh, and kind of as I said before, you know, the Windows file system doesn't really know how big that file creation or extension is going to be. So kind of as you said, it, it's just going to look for the next available allocation. Well, what we're doing is, is something rather simple, but yet quite sophisticated. In the background, we're able to monitor your system, and we're seeing all the I.O. traffic, all the file creations, 
uh, all the modifications and so forth. And we know strictly from that behavioral analytics and our monitoring of how big that file is going to be. So we can now tell Windows, we can feed back that intelligence back to the Windows file system. So that way when the file system now sees an incoming file creation, we can now advise Windows on what's the best allocation to use for this um, file creation or write request. So now you're getting these nice, large, sequential writes. And, you know, that kind of ties in a little bit to, I'm going to throw in one of the questions here from, from Brian Saxberg, where he's talking about, you know, relating kind of some of this to the block size. I think he might be referring to the NTFS cluster size. And then talking a little bit about, you know, defragmentation. And while we're on that subject, you know, defragmentation was kind of fixing this problem after it had already kind of appeared. What we're doing is more proactively. Okay, we can get in there and, and ahead of that right, tell Windows where the larger chunks of free space are such that they can be allocated without causing or allowing the file to fragment in the first place. Okay, so what we're able to do then, again, is very simply providing that intelligence to the Windows file system so it can do a better job. Remember, Windows is still in control. Windows is still doing the right Okay, it's still abiding by all the rules and protocols of the NTFS file system. But what I like to use is this analogy. Okay, think about this, guys. If you wanted to carry a gallon of water from one place to another, think about this. You could do it in a hundred small individual Dixie cups and just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, or don't you think it would be far more efficient if you just carried the one big gallon jug and took it across the room? You know, you could do it all in one shot there. So that's kind of what we're helping Windows to do. We're helping to enforce that behavior within the file system so you're getting those nice sequential writes. And definitely that's going to be more efficient and more optimum, Jennifer. Thanks, Howard. I was thinking about your analogy. I guess it depends if I'm trying to get a workout or not. <laughs> if I want to go gallon jug or Dixie cups. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, you can carry some weights with you, I guess. I don't know. You know? <laughs> so I think the net takeaway here is that, you know, we can see that this intelligence is helping the Windows OS find the best allocation of the logical layers. And, um, you know, since the next available is, is rarely, if ever, the right size, we got this engine that's going to help coach Windows into that. Um, now, as powerful as this engine is, and, and let me just give you what this engine does and what this means. Uh, this, what this engine does is it literally removes 30% of the I.O. that the VMs issue. Like, they're just gone. Like, if it was going to take 100,000 I.O.s to process a gig of data, with this engine in place, it now only takes 70,000 I.O.s. Now, that's some math. If you, if you think about that across all of your workloads, across all of your servers hitting your backend storage, that adds up. That's a big deal. And that's where you start kind of seeing that that throughput, uh, that transfer rate starts really picking up. Now the other engine though, as good as this one is, is I, maybe even more powerful, but, but at least equal to the, the engine we just talked about. And this is our DRAM read caching engine. Now this engine is where we are establishing what I like to refer to as a tier zero cache. So you know, you're basically leveraging the idle available DRAM sitting there on any given VM or physical server, and we're just utilizing any of that memory that's just sitting there idle and free and going otherwise unused and wasted, and we're able to, to leverage it to serve up hot reads. So the real genius of this engine is that it's completely automatic. You do not have to carve out or allocate any extra memory for the cache. The software is aware moment by moment of how much memory is unused at any given time, and it's only using that portion to serve hot reads. If that is called for by something else, our software will release immediately the memory that it's been using. So that way, you're never having an issue of resource contention. You don't have to worry about memory starvation because the intelligence of this engine is completely dynamic and automatic. Now, you know, if you're if you're during peak times, our engine backs off. Um, so it's it works very very well in that regard. Um, the other thing that I, I like to touch on real quick is that when people start hearing about you know read caching, they 
start going, gosh, this must be capacity intensive, especially SQL, since SQL is just such a hug and it'll grab everything you present to it if you haven't placed a limit on how much memory SQL can use. Now, for our software, this simply isn't true. We found that just maintaining four gigs of free memory on some systems is oftentimes more than enough to offload 25, 30% of reads from having to go down to storage and just serving it directly from DRAM. So it's not always about being capacity intensive. Uh, our behavioral analytics engine is so powerful that we can leverage just a little bit of DRAM, just a sliver of it. And keep in mind, it, you know, reading from DRAM is going to be 10 to 15 times faster than reading from SSD. So just a little bit of capacity that you probably already have sitting there can have a huge impact on offloading a lot of that noisy I.O., those hot reads that would otherwise have to go down the full stack to storage and back. And, and Howard, you know, I, I just want to come to you real quick and see, did I leave anything out? Is there anything that you'd like to add on to that? No, I think, you know, it, you've covered it quite well. You know, there are two things that I think are very unique, though, to our IntelliMemory caching, which I think is why, you know, we have nine of the top ten PC manufacturers licensing our technology embedded in their systems. And, of course, you probably haven't heard of us because they license that technology under their own names. But the two things, as you indicate, is dynamic memory usage and what we mean by that is that we'll only use memory that's free and available, um, that's not being used anywhere else by other processes or application. And if any system or user process needs memory, and we have that memory already allocated to our cache, we're dynamically going to give that memory back to Windows so those applications never run into any type of you know, memory contention or starvation situation. The second part, as you know, is our intelligence of what to put into the cache uh, for the best benefit. You know, there, there are literally dozens of different type of caching technologies or algorithms. And, you know, and some use something like, hey, you know, we read it, just throw it in the cache and let's figure it out if we, you know, are getting good success. That's not very efficient, and it's something we don't do. Okay. What we're actually doing is being able to monitor the system in the background, and we're seeing what data is being read most frequently, okay, what range of data blocks are being accessed. And since we are armed with that information, we know precisely what data should be put into cache, and then how long it stays there is dependent upon how relevant that information is, how well it's being used to satisfy other IOs, but we're not populating or polluting the cache with a bunch of guesswork. Um, we have some very sophisticated intelligence there to uh, properly put the data that's going to give you the best benefit. And so that's what's going to give you those performance gains. And what we found is that, you know, all of those small IOs tend to really create that big dent in performance. And mm -hmm. if we can, uh, you know, satisfy many of those I.O. requests out of memory. And as you pointed out, Jennifer, memory-to-memory -memory data transfers are 10 to 15 times faster than going to flash or SSD, okay? means that those I.O.s, which are the important ones because they're coming up frequently, right, are the ones to get satisfied from the cache. They're getting satisfied more quickly, which means now the applications get their hands on the data more quickly can process more data within the same time frame, and get this, those IOs didn't have to go to storage, which means the, there's far less congestion or competing IO traffic of all this extra noise because we got rid of perhaps 30, 40, 50 percent of the IO traffic. Now your storage system has greater bandwidth capability to focus on the I.O. traffic that is truly does have to go to storage. So I think, you know, Jennifer, with all of that ability to offload I.O. traffic, that's going to increase the bandwidth of storage and so forth, and I think that's where people are going to see the biggest benefit in performance. 
Well, thank you, Howard. I really appreciate that. Now, just a couple uh, housekeeping items. We have run a few minutes over. We're going to go into the home stretch here, the last couple of uh, speaking points about the trial where, if you can stick around for that, great. We are recording the session, so if you do have an obligation you have to drop off, uh, please feel free to do so. This is also the moment to get your questions in. We've got a couple in there, but if you have questions any deeper about the technology, compatibility with virtualization, licensing, start dropping those questions in right now so we can cover those off during the Q&A. Um, so here we have, real quick, just kind of a, a, the one thing I want to just mention on this last slide here is that, you know, what does this mean? You know, we talked about the fact that the other engine gets rid of 30% of all write I.O., how it writes is how it reads, it writes clean, it reads clean. On this engine, the IntelliMemory engine, this gets rid of another 25 to 30% of all read I.O. Uh, and by serving it from DRAM. So, so you, now again, kind of do the math, this is a huge impact on your ecosystem. Um, so some examples. Um, you know, I'll just touch on one or two of these briefly. We've already talked about Christus Health. They did a, you know, that kind of um, uh, overnight virtualization thing. Wasn't that great? They were really suffering with performance over time. They were a very short period of time into their new hardware environment, looking at already doing upgrades. They brought us in and it completely solved it. So they were able to cancel the PO to upgrade forklift, upgrade their hardware. Um, ASL Marketing, they had uh, SQL batch imports dropped from 27 hours to 12 hours. I was fortunate enough to be personally involved in that and got to see that myself. That was really neat. And I hear this stuff all the time. Um, so moving on here, you know, there's, there's other benefits that we've got, you know, tons of case studies up on our website. Go ahead and browse there. I just can't say enough about the software and, and you know, looking at what it does with the IO, IOs eliminated, um, you know, we have write IOs eliminated 32%. This is pretty average. This is a screenshot from a production system one of our customers provided to us. Uh, read IOs eliminated is around 64%. Again, that's right in the sweet spot. You get analytics on your total time removed, um, total time saved, I should say. Now, how do you test this? Um, there's a couple of thoughts here that we'll just go over really briefly. So first of all, you are going to receive your free NFR copy. And, and when you get it, you can install it on your target server. And with SQL specifically, because that's why you're here, you're going to want to make sure that you have a memory limit in place on your SQL server. You can certainly email us and ask us for a recommendation. If you're dealing with a really large server, let's go for 16 gigs free. If you're dealing with a smaller server that maybe only has a total of 32 gigs on it, let's go for eight free if we can. Otherwise, um, four is going to be kind of skinny for us to get the benefits on that big of a server. Uh, but anything, you know, below 32 gigs, four, four to six gigs would be great. So it's kind of a sliding scale of recommendation um, for where you place your limit. Install the software, get that memory limit on SQL, and then just come back and look at the dashboard a few days later. Schedule a call with one of our engineers to do an analysis as well. That being said, um, I also really want to emphasize something else, and that is um, what I refer to as kind of our three levels of deployment. Uh, and so a lot of times you have just one server that's having performance issues. You install Velocity on that server, and you may or may not see the benefit. Velocity is working. Velocity is doing its thing. But we talked about that IO Blender effect of all of the neighboring VMs and their workloads. Those neighboring VMs, even though they're not actually touching the work that you're trying to improve, could be the source of your slowdowns. So we may even want to consider a level two deployment. What I mean by that is you deploy to all of the VMs on the host. Now, a level three deployment would be deploying to all the VMs in your entire environment to alleviate that backend pressure from every VM source, every IO source off of your backend storage. And we see really miraculous things happening when people go to that level of deployment. Now, there's a couple of different things you can do. First, there is a pre-assessment tool. So that is a free tool. I don't have a slide here on it, but it is called the IO assessment tool. If you would like the IO assessment tool, go ahead and drop a comment into our, our Q&A box here. Just say IOAT, IO assessment tool. Just drop in IOAT and we'll get you that free tool. You do not have to install this on any servers. Uh, it installs on just one server by itself and it uses remote WMI calls to collect existing perfmon data from your target servers. So you're not installing an agent or anything on those target servers. You're just able to collect the data. That will tell you, are these servers even candidates? Am I even suffering from this IO blender effect that we've been talking about today in these IO taxes? That will very clearly identify servers that are very good candidates uh, as a pre-check. The other thing that we can do then is if you want to keep that NFR in your back pocket, because that's your free copy, right? And you don't, want to, you don't want to burn it up on testing and you're like, let me use some trialware to test first and then I'll apply my free license to the server I want. We can get you trialware. Now, the trialware can include the Velocity Management Console, which is 
bundled in with the product at no charge. And you can actually use the Velocity Management Console to deploy to as many servers as you want. You can go to that level two or even that level three deployment. In fact, I've just wrapped up in the last week, I've just wrapped up three level three deployments with smaller companies. They had two to three hosts, anywhere from 15 to 25 VMs each. They took us up on this. They did a level three deployment, set up the console, deployed to all 25 VMs in their environment, and one for one, they called back in saying, we noticed XYZ improvements, users stopped getting dropped, our, our disk errors um, went down by 80%, we stopped getting performance calls completely on our XYZ application. Um, so it's extremely successful, it's an extremely fast way to test and just get, get the proof in the pudding for you. So if you want that experience, type in VMC, Velocity Management Console. So, and if you want both, just type in both. Um, so we'll be more than happy to deliver all of that to you along with your free NFR. And, uh, you know, we wanted to thank you for attending today, um, but let's go ahead and get into some of the Q&A here that we have because I see we do have some good questions in here. So um, we're going to go into Q&A right now. Again, this will be recorded, so if you need to drop off, feel free, but we would welcome to stay. So Howard, one question that I see from Tom is he says, our SQL server and its host are running on SSDs. Would this be less of an issue for us? So Howard, I'll, I'll tap you on the shoulder for that question. Well, it's certainly not less of an issue. I mean, SSDs are, are faster than traditional spinning disks. But, um, you know, it's all about the reduction of IOs. Imagine how much better your environment could be if you got rid of 30, 40, 50 percent of the IO traffic hitting that SSD not to mention all the extra wear and tear that's occurring because of all that extra I.O. traffic that's being generated today. So, you know, I think it is uh, quite appropriate and, you know, again, satisfying those read I.O.s from memory are going to be many times faster than the speed at which it's going to the SSD today. So I think we're very appropriate for uh, SSD environments. Great. Howard, I'll read off the next question here from Brad. We are using desktop laptop computers to log into our domain via an on-site AD server. AD connects to one of two virtual terminal servers based on the user load, so they're load balancing there. Uh, the terminal server is used to connect to software running on our virtual SQL server. Would this product help us? Yes, because every application in your environment is accessing data, generating IOs. I might suggest in this environment to not only put velocity um, on your terminal servers, but also on the individual user desktop systems, uh, whether they be physical or virtual. Um, if we can eliminate the source of I.O. contention at each point of touching the data, that's certainly going to dramatically help the behavior of the application and get faster responsiveness to the users. Thank you, Howard. All right, the next question is from Dalen and, uh, or Dylan. And um, it is, have you seen any issues with hybrid storage devices like Nimble? Sounds like we would be dealing with multiple layers of caching. So Howard, I'll, I'll just throw a comment in and then turn, turn that over to you. Um, so that's really interesting. Nimble, we, we have so many customers running us on Nimble uh, that about three years ago at VMworld, I think the seventh customer came into our executive suite to meet with us. And by the way, guys, we're going to be at VMworld this year. So if you're planning to go to VMworld, let's do another drop into the chat box. Just type in VMworld. We can schedule uh, an executive sit down. I'll personally be there. We can meet in person, that type of thing. So um, just let us know and we can schedule a meeting. But that being said, um, you know, we had, I think, seven customers almost in a row come in using us on Nimble and raving about our software, raving about Nimble, that we actually had one of our customers introduce us to our local, uh, I'm in so Southern California, to introduce us to our local Nimble team at the time before the HP acquisition. And we ended up getting together with them for lunch. We did a bunch of whiteboarding to answer this exact question, Howard. So you were part of those whiteboard sessions and uh, we're dealing with multiple layers of caching. What was our conclusion with our partnership with Nimble, which we actually ended up doing a joint webinar with Nimble with one of our mutual customers um, to talk about how the, the solutions are compatible. Well, you know, it, it was a beautiful thing because, you know, at the very beginning, you know, they were kind of touting, you know, their caching capabilities, their castle architecture and stuff like that. And much of the same talking points were being referenced by both of our companies. But when we actually drew it out on a whiteboard in – determined at what layer was each of our products residing in, it was very clear and obvious that what we were doing was certainly beneficial in helping the nimble storage architecture because, again, we're seeing that I.O. request bef 
before it gets sent to the storage system. So anything that we can do um, ahead of that is going to obviously reap huge rewards and benefits and allow the nimble architecture to do more of its work that it does extremely well when the I.O. gets down to the storage level. So it was mutually beneficial across the board for Nimble, for us, and most importantly, for our common customers. Yeah, in fact, we, we ended up publishing a case study with a customer who did the three-way webinar with us, uh, Victor Treatment Center. So if you head to our website and, and check out Victor Treatment Center case study, it, it really covers it well. Alan asks a question, and this may be our last question. I'll have to, I'll have to scroll down and see. So if anyone's got questions, this is your uh, kind of last call for questions um, warning here. Alan says, how big and how much I.O. does a company need to experience before you see a benefit? I think this comes down to, this is a really good question, Alan. This comes down in my mind to the ROI of the product in your environment. Um, first of all, is your environment having problems? Um, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. And if so, can you clearly articulate and define what those problems are? Um, and that's part of what we'll do with our cons consultation. A lot of times folks are having problems that they don't realize anything can be done about, so they just count them in their mind. Like, you know, what I call Windows, um, I call them Windows um, shadow issues. I got on one of those calls with a customer who deployed the 17 VMs. They called it the little niggling issues that you have in Windows are all gone. And I've seen that happen over and over and over again. So it kind of depends on the scale, but they also had a lot of other severe problems too. So it depends on the scale of what's actually happening in your environment um, and is it a fit? Are you actually suffering from IO degradation and maybe there's some symptoms that you're not associating to that IO degradation that will resolve once you have our software installed. That happens a lot. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of I.O. to, to have, have some performance slowdowns or issues, and it, it really um, it just is, like I said, the proof is in the pudding. You, you just need to try it. It's one of the reasons, one, we offer a 90-day money-back guarantee, but no one ever has to use the 90-day money-back guarantee because they use the software in a full trial before they even buy it, so they already have their ROI proven out. That's why we offer that, that um, ability to you to try our software everywhere. Um, so I'm just going to scroll down here and see if there are anything else. Okay, we got a couple more questions. Uh, Alan, where can I get a recorded version? We will email this to you after uh, WebEx renders the videos. We will email this to everybody. Um, and then we've got a couple more requests. Okay, so we've got a question in here. Um, from Karunia, I hope I've said your name correctly. We recently had logical inconsistent errors. Let me, my, sorry, my chat window is moving on me. The conversation thread moved. Okay, so we recently had logical inconsistent errors, 823. Will anyone of your tools help troubleshoot the root cause? Howard, are you familiar with that particular error? Is that something that we may want to ask one of our tech support guys if they've ever seen that and if our software will help? You know, I'm not extremely familiar with that specific <laughs> error, but it has been well documented that uh, a number of different file system problematic issues, um, such as application hangs, system hangs, system crashes, um, file system inconsistencies, can be resolved by making the behavior of Windows more efficient. And when Windows just gets it's knickers tied in a knot so bad that it can't easily resolve those, those I.O. throughput concerns. Um, things go to uh, um, kind of get laid out incorrectly, and you do see these type of errors. So that's something I'd probably want to take on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the customer and uh, take a look at what's really happening underneath the hood there to give them a solid answer. Okay, Dawn, if you wouldn't mind um, pulling that contact out for us so that we that Howard can uh, respond personally after the webinar, we'd really appreciate it. Okay. Um, okay, so there's two last questions. I'm going to take the last question first. <laughs> um, and again, if, if anyone's got a, a question they've been shy to ask, now's the time. Um, but Dylan asked, is the product compatible with VMs running in Azure? Yes. Um, again, kind of my, my little joke earlier that, you know, what if I told you that 
the cloud is just somebody else's server. It's 100% compatible. We install right in the Windows operating system. So if it's compatible with Windows, it's compatible with us. And we're also not focused on installing on the host itself. So we're not, no one asks this question, but a lot of people usually do. So we're not installing in the, v, the ESXi host or into the Hyper-V host or KVM or, or Citrix or whatever you're using. We're focused on that Windows experience. We're installed within Windows. We're fenced by Windows, which also I'll answer another question that hasn't been asked is, you know, if you've got vMotion or live migration, the VMs are failing over or high availability type movement, we're compatible with all of that because we're just nested right into that VM. So no matter where that VM is, whether it's physical, virtual, or in the cloud, 100% compatible. So Howard, there's a more technical question here for you um, from Hassam. It says, our SQL server is on VM is on a VM machine on an ESXi host. The utilization of CPU was above 80% and memory utilization is almost at 97% all day. Uh, he increased um, the processor core and memory. The memory utilization dropped to 50% and CPU to 20%. Will our, is there anything that our software can do to help with these types of utilizations in that environment? Well, I think you know now that the CPU and memory uh, utilization issues pretty much have been solved in your environment, we can now truly focus on reducing your I.O. traffic. So yes, our software will be extremely beneficial in this environment. Fantastic. That's all of the questions. If anyone had a question that you, you didn't get in or you think of later, um, when you receive the email with your uh, delivery of your software and your uh, replay of the link, feel free to email us back with those questions. We'll have one of our engineers get back to you directly. And we really appreciate you guys uh, attending today. And thank you for checking out our software. We look forward to, uh, to speaking with you in the future. Thanks a lot. All right, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.